Welcome back for chapter 11 of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. My window is open and there's a cardinal outside. That's the birds that are bright red and he is making a lot of noise. You might hear him. Chapter 11, The Duffel Puds Made Happy. Lucy followed the great lion out into the passage and at once she saw coming towards them an old man, barefoot, dressed in a red robe. His white hair was crowned with a chaplet of oak leaves. His beard fell to his girdle, that means his waist, and he supported himself with a curiously carved staff. When he saw Aslan, he bowed low and said, Welcome, sir, to the least of your houses. Do you grow weary, Koryakin, of ruling such foolish subjects as I have given you here? No, said the magician. They are very stupid, but there is no real harm in them. I begin to grow rather fond of the creatures. Sometimes, perhaps, I'm a little impatient, waiting for the day when they can be governed by wisdom instead of by this rough magic. All in good time, Koryakin, said Aslan. Yes, all in good time, sir, was the answer. Do you intend to show yourself to them? Oh, no, said the lion with a little half growl that meant, Lucy thought, the same as a laugh. I should frighten them out of their senses. Many stars will grow old and come to take their rest in islands before your people are ready for that. And today before sunset, I, meet, I must visit Trumpkin the dwarf. Oh, we know him. Where he sits in the castle of Care Paravel, counting the days until his master Caspian comes home. I will tell him all your story, Lucy. Do not look so sad. We shall meet again soon. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, what do you call soon? I call all times soon. And instantly he was vanished away, and Lucy was alone with the magician. Gone, said he, and you and I quite crestfallen. It's always like that. You can't keep him. It's not as if he were a tame lion. And how did you enjoy my book? Parts of it very much indeed, said Lucy. Did you know I was there all the time? Well, of course, I knew when I let the duffers make themselves invisible that you would be coming along presently to take the spell off. But I wasn't quite sure of the exact day. And I wasn't especially on the watch this morning. You see, they had made me invisible too, and being invisible always makes me so sleepy. Hi-ho! There, I'm yawning again. Are you hungry? Well, perhaps I am a little, said Lucy. I've no idea what the time is. Come, said the magician. All times may be soon to Aslan. But in my home, all hungry times are one o'clock. He led her a little way down the passage and opened a door. Passing in, Lucy found herself in a pleasant room full of sunlight and flowers. The table was bare when they entered, but it was, of course, a magic table. And at a word from the old man, the tablecloth, silver, plates, glasses, and food all appeared. I hope this is what you would like, said he. I've tried to give you food more like the food of your own land than perhaps you've had lately. It's lovely, said Lucy, and so it was. An omelet, piping hot cold lamb and green peas, a strawberry ice, lemon squash to drink with a meal, and a cup of chocolate to follow. Drinkable chocolate. But the magician himself drank only wine and ate only bread. There was nothing alarming about him, and Lucy and he were soon chatting away like old friends. When will the spell work, said Lucy? Will the duffers be visible again at once? Oh, yes, they're visible now but they're probably all asleep still. They always take a rest in the middle of the day. And now that they're visible, are you going to let them off being ugly? Will you make them as they were before? Well, that's a rather delicate question, said the musician. You see, it's only they who think they were so nice to look at before. They say they've been uglified, but that isn't what I called it. Many people might say the change was for the better. Are they awfully conceited? They are, he said. 
or at least the chief duffer is, and he's taught all the rest to be. They always believe every word he says. <laughs> we notice that, said Lucy. Yes, we'd get on better without him, in a way. Of course, I could turn him into something else, or even put a spell on him, which would make them not believe a word he said. But I don't like to do that. It's better for them to admire him than to admire nobody. Don't they admire you? asked Lucy. Oh, not me, said the musician. They wouldn't admire me. What was it you uglified them for? I mean, what they called uglified. Well, they wouldn't do what they were told. Their work is to mine the garden and raise food. Not for me, as they imagined, but for themselves. They wouldn't do it at all if I didn't make them. And of course, for a garden, you want water. There's a beautiful spring about half a mile away up the hill. And from that spring, there flows a stream which comes right past the garden. All I asked them to do was to take their water from the stream instead of trudging up to the spring with their buckets two or three times a day and tiring themselves out besides spilling half of it on their way back. But they wouldn't see it. And in the end, they refused point blank. Are they really as stupid as all that? Asked Lucy. Don't call anybody stupid, okay? The magician sighed. You would not believe the troubles I've had with them. A few months ago, they were all for washing up the plates and knives before dinner. They said it would save time afterwards. I've caught them planting boiled potatoes to save cooking them when they were dug up. One day, the cat got into the dairy and 20 of them were at work moving all of the milk out. No one thought of moving out the cat. But I see you finished. Let's go and look at the duffers now that they can be looked at. They went into another room, which was full of polished instruments, hard to understand, such as astrolabes, oreillers, chronoscopes, poesimeters, choriambuses, and theobold... I should know what all of those are, but I don't. I know what the first one is, and maybe one time I'll show you a picture of what they were. And here, when they had come to the window, the magician said, there, there are your duffers. Okay, let me show you a picture of them. That's weird, isn't it? I don't see anybody, said Lucy. And what are those mushroom things? The things she pointed out were dotted all over the level grass. And they were certainly very like mushrooms, but far too big. The stalks were about three feet high. We heard three feet before this with the food, remember? And the umbrellas were about the same length from edge to edge. When she looked carefully, though, she noticed that the stalks joined the umbrellas, not in the middle like a normal mushroom, but at one side, which gave an unbalanced look to them. And there was something sort of like a little bundle lying on the grass at the foot of each stalk. In fact, the longer she gazed at them, the less like mushrooms they appeared. The umbrella part was not really round as she had thought at first. It was longer than it was broad, and it widened at one end. There were a great many of them, 50 or more. And then the clock struck three. Instantly, a most extraordinary thing happened. Each of the mushrooms suddenly turned upside down. The little bundles which had lain at the bottom of the stalks were actually heads and bodies. The stalks themselves were legs, but not two legs to each body. Each body had a single thick leg right under it, not to one side like the leg of a one-legged man, and at the end of it, a single enormous foot, a broad-toed foot with the curls curling up a little so that it rather looked like a small canoe. She saw in a moment why they had looked like mushrooms. They'd been lying flat on their backs, each with its single leg straight up in the air and its enormous foot spread out above it. She learned afterwards that this was their ordinary way of resting, for the foot kept off both the rain and the sun. And for a monopod, mono means one, for a monopod to lie under its own foot is almost as good as being in a tent. Oh, the funnies, the funnies, cried Lucy, bursting into laughter. Did you make them like that? Yes, yes. 
I made the duffers into monopods, said the magician, and then he too was laughing till the tears ran down his cheeks. But watch, he added. It was worth watching. Of course, these little one-footed men couldn't walk or run as we do. They got about by jumping, like fleas or frogs. And what jumps they made, as if each big foot were a mass of springs. And with what bounce they came down. That was what made the thumping noise which had so puzzled Lucy yesterday. For now they were jumping in all directions and they were calling out to one another. Hey lads, we're visible again. Visible we are, said one in a tasseled red cap who was obviously the chief monopod. And what I say is, when chaps are visible, why, they can see one another. Ah, there it is, there it is, chief, cried all the others. There's the point. No one's got a clearer head than you. You couldn't have made it plainer. She caught the old man napping, that little girl did, said the chief monopod. We've beaten him this time. Just what we were going to say ourselves, chimed the chorus. You're getting stronger than ever today, chief. Keep it up, keep it up. But do they dare to talk about you like that, said Lucy? They seem to be so afraid of you yesterday. Don't they know that you might be listening? That's one of the funny things about the duffers, said the magician. One minute they talk as if I ran everything and overheard everything and was extremely dangerous. The next moment, they think they can take me in by tricks that a baby would see through. Bless them. Here are the duffers. Will they have to be turned back into their proper shapes? Asked Lucy. Oh, I do hope it wouldn't be unkind to leave them as they are. Do they really mind very much? They seem pretty happy. I say, look at that jump. What were they like before? Common little dwarfs, said he. Nothing like so nice as the sort that you have in Narnia. It would be a pity to change them back, said Lucy. They're so funny and they're rather nice. Do you think it would make any difference if I told them that? I'm sure it would, said the magician, if you could get it into their heads. Will you come with me and try? No, 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 no. You'll get on far better without me, he said. Thanks awfully for the lunch, said Lucy, and she turned quickly away. She ran down the stairs, which she had come up so nervously that morning, and cannoned into Edmund at the bottom. She went up in the morning, and the clock had already struck three o'clock, so she's been up there for a long time. All the others were there with him waiting, and Lucy's conscience smote her when she saw their anxious faces and realized how long she had forgotten them. It's all right, she shouted. Everything's all right. The magician's a brick, and I've seen him, Aslan. After that, she went from them like the wind and out into the garden. Here, the earth was shaking with the jumps and the air ringing with the shouts of the monopods. Both were doubled when they caught sight of her. Here she comes, here she comes, they cried. Three cheers for the little girl. Ah, she put it across the old gentleman properly, she did. And we're extremely regrettable, said the chief monopod, that we can't give you the pleasure of seeing us as we were before we were uglified. For you wouldn't believe the difference, and there is the truth. For there's no denying we're mortal ugly now, so we won't deceive you. Eh, that we are, chief, that we are, echoed the others, bouncing like so many toy balloons. You've said it, you've said it. But I don't think you're ugly at all, said Lucy, shouting to make herself heard. I think you look very nice. Hear her, hear her, said the monopads. True for you, Missy, very nice we look. You wouldn't find a handsomer lot. They said this without any surprise and didn't seem to notice that they had changed their minds. She's a saying, remarked the chief monopod, as how we looked very nice before we were uglified. True for you, chief, true for you, chanted the others. That's what she says. We heard her ourselves. I did not, bawled Lucy. I said you're quite nice now. So she did, so she did, said the chief monopod. She said we were nice then. Hear them both, hear them both, said the monopods. There's a pair for you, always right. They couldn't have put it better. But we're saying just the opposite, said Lucy, stamping her foot with impatience. So you are, to be sure, to be sure, said the monopods. Nothing like an opposite. Keep it up, both of you. You're enough to drive anyone mad, said Lucy, and she gave it up. But the monopod seemed perfectly contented, and she decided that, on the whole, the conversation had been a success. And before everyone went to bed that evening, something else happened, which made them even more satisfied with their one-legged condition. 
Caspian, and all the Narnians went back as soon as possible on the shore to give their news to Rince and others on board the Don Treader, who were by now in considerable anxiety. And of course, the monopods went with them, bouncing like footballs and agreeing with one, uh, like a soccer ball. That's what he means, because footballs, American footballs don't bounce like that, but soccer balls do. They were all agreeing with one another in loud voices till Eustace said, I wish the magician would make them inaudible so that you couldn't hear them instead of invisible. He was soon sorry he had spoken because then he had to explain that an inaudible thing is something you can't hear. And though he took a lot of trouble, he never felt sure that the monopods had really understood. And what especially annoyed him was that in the end they said this, eh, he can't put things the way our chief does, but you'll learn, young man. Hark to him. He'll show you how to say things. There's a speaker for you. When they reached the bay, Reepicheep had a brilliant idea. He had his little coracle lowered. That was the boat they found on that island. And he paddled himself about in it till the monopods were thoroughly interested. He then stood up in it and he said, Worthy and intelligent monopods, you do not need boats. Each of you has a foot that will do instead. Just jump as lightly as you can on the water and see what happens. Well, the chief monopod hung back and he warned the others that they'd find the water powerful wet, but one or two of the younger ones tried it almost at once. And then a few others followed their example. And at last, the whole lot did the same. It worked perfectly. The huge single foot of a monopod acted as a natural raft or boat. And when Reepa Cheep had taught them how to cut rude paddles for themselves, they all paddled about the bay and round the Don Treader, looking for all the world like a fleet of little canoes with a little fat dwarf standing up in the extreme stern of each. The stern is the back. And then they had races, and bottles of wine were lowered down to them from the ship as prizes. And the sailors stood leaning over the ship's sides, and they laughed till their own sides ached. The duffers were also very pleased with their new name of monopods, which seemed to them a magnificent name, though they never got it right. That's just what we are, they bellowed. Money puds, pomenades, putty mons. Just what it was on the tips of our tongue to call ourselves. But they soon got it mixed up with their old name of duffers, and they finally settled down to calling themselves the duffel puds. And that is what they will probably be called for centuries. That evening, all the Narnians dined upstairs with the magician. And Lucy noticed how different the whole top floor looked now that she was no longer afraid of it. The mysterious signs on the doors were still mysterious, but now they looked as if they had kind and cheerful meanings, and even the bearded mirror now just seemed funny rather than frightening. At dinner, everyone had by magic what everyone liked best to eat and drink. And after dinner, the magician did a very useful and beautiful piece of magic. He laid two blank sheets of parchment on the table, and he asked Drinian to give him an exact account of their voyage up to this date. And as Drinian spoke, everything he described came out on the parchment in clear lines till at last each sheet was a splendid map of the Eastern Ocean showing Galma, Terebinthia, the Seven Isles, the Lone Islands, Dragon Island, Burnt Island, Death Water, and the land of the Duffers itself, all exactly the right shapes and in the right positions. They were the first maps ever made of those seas, and they were better than any that have been made since without magic. For on these, though the towns and mountains looked at first just as they would on an ordinary map, when the magician lent them a magnifying glass, you saw that they were perfect little pictures of the real things, so that you could see the very castle and the slave market and the streets in Narrowhaven, all very clear, though very distant like things seen through the wrong end of a telescope. The only drawback was that the coastline of most of the islands was incomplete, for the map showed only what Drinian had actually seen with his own eyes. When they were finished, the magician kept one for himself, and he presented the other to Caspian. It still hangs in his chamber of instruments at Care Paravel. But the magician could tell them nothing about seas or lands further east. He did, however tell them that about seven years earlier, a Narnian ship had put in at his waters and that she had on board the Lords Revillian, Argos, Mavramorn, and Roop. 
so they judged that the golden man they had seen lying in death water must be the Lord Restamar. Next day, the magician magically mended the stern of the Dawn Treader where it had been damaged by the sea serpent, so now it has a new tail, and loaded her with useful gifts. There was a most friendly parting, and when she sailed, two hours after noon, all the Duffelpuds paddled out with her to the harbor mouth and cheered until she was out of sound of their cheering. And that is the end of chapter 11.